Zuko is one of the more important figures within Avatar The Last Airbender. He was, at first, the catalyst that caused the gang to move from place to place seeking refuge, but he became far more than that. When Aang had no one left to teach him firebending, Zuko, having been driven out by his sister, joined Team Avatar, bringing with him all the knowledge he had accumulated over the years, including that which he had gained from Uncle Iroh. But this all cascaded down because of one simple moment, and that was Zuko's duel against the Fire Lord and his refusal to accept that one had to make hard decisions and be ruthless if one was to rule the Fire Nation. But what if Zuko had fought Ozai? Well, let's see. Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, only 25% of our viewers are subscribed, so if you're a fan of the video, please like and double check if you're subscribed. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Zuko sat on his hands and knees, face to the ground. Please, father, I meant no disrespect. You will fight, Zuko. As Zuko laid there, he tried to go over what he had done wrong. Had he not fought to protect the assets of the Fire Nation and those loyal? Was this not what a good Fire Lord would do? It was then that Ozai knelt down and lifted Zuko's head to face him by its top knot. Your weakness dishonors me, Ozai said. Your weakness dishonors yourself. It dishonors your nation. You've completely missed what it means to be a member of the Fire Nation. Flames do not burn from compassion, but by pure, unadulterated rage. Restore your honor. Fight me. Zuko sat there for a moment, looking deep into the sooty black abyss of his own father's gaze, and saw no love within those eyes, only cold expectations at the center of a burning flame of rage. It was then that Zuko truly felt that if he didn't fight Ozai, that he would be killed. There was something in Ozai's eye that showed that. If he needed to kill his son to make a point, he would. The only way to survive was to fight. At that moment, Zuko's tears stopped and were replaced by determination. He wasn't helpless. He had trained for this his entire life. He had the tools to win. He just needed to make use of them in proper fashion. As Zuko was lifted by his top knot, his right leg pushed forward into a kneeling position to gain stability. Ozai saw this and let go of Zuko's hair and slowly rose up along with his son. Fight or die. Ozai began taking steps back to put a little distance between them. Zuko lowered into a fighting position. Ozai didn't even bother doing so. He believed himself so vastly superior that a true defensive stance would not be required. Attack, Prince Zuko, Ozai demanded. Zuko took a couple breaths in. Each time he did, flames expelled from his nose. He planned to use this quick inhalation of oxygen to fuel his flames. He would then open his eyes, take two steps forward, and push his fist out, expelling a bright red flame from his fist at his father, who would simply split it down the middle with the breath of his nostrils. Ozai gave a bit of a smile before it turned into a snarl. He lunged forward. He would not hold back against his son. He would teach him what it was to disrespect the Fire Lord in his own war room. He would offer a quick succession of punches before attempting to sweep his leg across the floor to send out a wave of fire. Zuko jumped over it and began to roll where he attempted the same technique. Ozai jumped up over the technique as well and proceeded to bring his foot down on top of Zuko, only for Zuko to roll to the side. Ozai would strike to the side, but Zuko would divide the flames with his own. This hit and run style of fighting continued for a while. It's a shame, Prince Zuko, the Fire Lord shouted shouted, to dance around me instead of facing me head on. Zuko took this as a new challenge to his honor and refused to back away from it. Rising from his stance, he stood resolute against his father, the same way his father stood against him. This brought another smile to Ozai's face. It was time to end this and give Zuko his public punishment. Ozai would catch Zuko's right hand and grip it tightly. He would then light a fire in his own right hand and begin to push it towards Zuko's chest. Zuko cried out as he fell to his knee. Ozai continued, raising the heat. He would leave a permanent reminder on Zuko of what it was to challenge his father. Zuko cried out in pain, but as the flames grew hotter, he realized there was no reasoning with his father. Zuko's fight or flight response kicked in, and after failing to pull away from his father, he decided to fight. In addition to his rage, Zuko began to take in many deep and long breaths, as if attempting to hyperventilate. Zuko's flames burned so hot that they turned white. Ozai was shocked at this display of strength and power. Ozai tried to push it back, but Zuko then began to burn Ozai's wrist as well. He burned it with the white-hot flame. Ozai sneered and slightly grunted, bearing the pain with a snarky smile. Well done. You've regained your honor. Let this be a lesson to you, Prince Zuko. Compassion is not the way of the Fire Nation. Flames can only burn if there is wood in the pyre. Power comes with sacrifice, and only those who sacrifice much can hope to gain much. Learn this lesson and become the greatest heir to ever be born. 
Ozai turned around and walked from the arena. Zuko almost wanted to cry, he was so happy. His father praised him. His father! For the first time in his life, he didn't feel like a screw-up. He had gained honor. Honor in his father's eyes. From there, Ozai began to take Zuko's preparation more seriously, much to Azula's frustration. First, mother had come to favor him, and now father was in preference to him as well. Azula's rage grew, and she began pouring her anger into her training. Iroh watched this with a hint of sorrow. Iroh would approach Azula during one of her intense sessions. Perfection, she screamed. I must attain perfection. Her orange flame turned a hint of blue. Impressive, Iroh said. Only the dedicated can attain a flame so hot and perfectly controlled that it turns blue. It's not perfect, it's still orange. Iroh was slightly disturbed by this. Orange hints at slight imperfection, but there's nothing wrong with that. Everyone has imperfections. Nobody can hope to be perfect. We must accept who we are, Azula. And that includes any present flaws. She turned to him. Flaws? Did you insinuate I possess flaws? That I'm a flawed human being? I have no flaws. I work day and night to be the perfect heir. I study through the day and work through the night. My complexion is perfect. My pie show strategies are perfect. Each stance, strike, and movement is perfect. Everything I do is perfect. Unlike you. You were not perfect. If you had been even half as dedicated to the task as I, Ba Sing Se would have fallen in the first hundred days, let alone six hundred. Your weakness is why Azulan passed you over as Fire Lord in preference to your younger brother Ozai. And I will not fall into the same trap as you. I won't make the same mistakes. I won't be passed over. I will be perfect, without flaw to show that my father has no choice but to recognize me as the rightful heir. Iroh stood there momentarily before speaking. Is it truly the throne you desire? Or is it your father's approval? Is it that you need to be Fire Lord? Or do you simply require him to recognize your hard work and your exceptional abilities? She didn't answer. I recognize you, Azula. She scoffed. Ha! That and a cup or bond will buy you exactly what you're worth, uncle. Nothing. You've never been anything, and you'll never be anything. Famed dragon of the West? What's a dragon to a god? I could slay a hundred dragons and still have the strength to walk down the mountain. You are nothing, uncle. Now leave my presence. Iroh had no choice but to oblige his niece's desires. Did the things she say hurt him? Yes. But what hurt him the most was knowing that she was attempting to prove something that everyone could see. He feared for Zuko. Zuko's decision and spontaneous jump in potential had caused his father to recognize him, but pride came with expectation, and only Azula truly understood that. Zuko was naive and kind. He was compassionate. He could not escape who he was as much as anyone could forbid the sun from rising in the east. He was riding high now, but this high would inevitably become a low. And when Zuko fell from grace, the fall would be great and devastating, and leave him worse than if he had lost to his father in the first place. Iroh would venture to Zuko's room, where he would find his nephew meticulously studying books from the greatest generals in history. Iroh recalled that at one time he had read those same books by the same authors, and had worked hard to take the strategies and turn them into his own. That was something Iroh always did when he was younger. He would attempt to learn things on the deepest possible level, because only when one knew every in and out of the lesson could they put it to practical use. This was the difference between someone who parroted another and one who spoke with authority on a subject. Knowledge was to know, wisdom was to take that knowledge and put it to practical use. And he sensed Zuko was seeking more than knowledge, he was seeking wisdom. Zuko heard his door open and turned with a smile. Oh, welcome uncle, please come in. Zuko stood in the presence of his uncle, which caused Iroh's previously dark expression to lighten. He waved him down, no need to stand for an old man like me. Zuko sat back down. You're my senior and my superior. I stand to honor you as you deserve, just as others are to honor me. Iroh's smile began to fade as he walked in. Zuko, I believe we should talk. Iroh pulled up a chair. About what, uncle? About the recent events, your honor and the politics of your family. Zuko sat there and listened carefully to his beloved uncle. Zuko, your Agni Kai with your father, your white flames and your displayed potential. None of those things are truly you. Your father commended you for displaying what he he believed was heartless behavior, but that behavior within you is aberrant. You're not heartless or cruel, and I fear that one day when you follow your heart as you're so prone to, you'll only find yourself losing the honor you have. Nephew, I'm worried that you're misconstruing honor with pride. The honor you won is yours. You should cash out with it while the going's good. If you become too greedy with your pride, you'll fall to destruction. 
Zuko smiled. I'm grateful that you care so much about me, uncle, but trust me, I can be worthy of the honor my father has given me. Iroh rubbed the back of his neck, stressing slightly. Zuko, your sister, Azula, is currently working her hardest to reach perfection, and she's drawing dangerously close, and she wants nothing more than to use this perfection to destroy you. Azula is a dangerous enemy for you to make. She's so much like her father and will do anything to surpass you. I know this personally. Zuko sat there. What do you propose I do, uncle? Simply give in? I thought you taught me to never give up and to continue to fight through no matter what. Iroh nodded. Yes, Prince Zuko, I did. But I need you to think about the cost of this fight. The cost if you lose. And even worse, the cost if you win. To go to war against Azula is to challenge a warrior princess who is as witty and intelligent as she is strong and dangerous. She, unlike you, has no inhibitions. She won't rest until you are destroyed, and she'll destroy you without mercy or guilt. If she had to kill you to win and knew that she could get away with it, you would be found face down in a pool somewhere, foaming from the mouth. Zuko's face seemed upset. Iroh looked down and sighed. I'm just trying to warn you, Zuko. You're not a ruthless person. I know your heart. But you're trying to dive into a world that requires ruthlessness. If you prepare to fight against Azula, you will have to face an opponent that will do anything to destroy you. Just please be careful. Iroh stood and walked out. As he closed the door behind him, he stood there in the hall and attempted to rub the stress from the bridge of his nose. There was only one person right now that could soothe this brewing war within the warring family, and Iroh needed to speak with him next. Iroh would approach the Fire Lord's throne room where he would see the silhouette of his brother from behind the roaring flames that gave light to the entire room. Iroh, Ozai said with a hint of surprise. To what do I owe this pleasure? A matter of importance, Iroh responded. Ozai sat to listen. Iroh continued. I suppose you have seen what your children have been doing as of late. Ozai remained silent yet still. Iroh continued. Azula is training for perfection, and Zuko is studying the greatest generals in history. This does not sound like a bad thing. I wish for my children to attain perfection and complete wisdom, Ozai said, finally breaking his silence. That in and of itself is not the issue, but the reason why instead. Azula is training for perfection to surpass her brother in your eyes, and Zuko is training for perfection to increase the pride and honor bestowed upon him from his duel with you. They're preparing to go to war with each other, the prize of their conquest being your acceptance. Ozai smiled, though it was hardly visible to Iroh. Is there something wrong with a little rivalry? Humans are one of the many creatures who hate change. Change can be hard, so we don't do it. Only when faced with a true threat to ourselves do we attempt to overcome and grow. What do you think this war is about, Iroh? It's through my threat that the nations have risen up against me, and it's by my force that I shall institute change. I will force humanity to adapt to a new status quo or perish. My children are learning this firsthand. Iroh shook his head. No, your children seek love and admiration from their parent. With Ursa gone, you're all they have left. They want your attention desperately and will do anything to get it. Do you not see that? Look at it as a father, not as Fire Lord, Ozai. You know what you have to do. Ozai sat there for a moment. You're right, Iroh. I know what I must do. Ozai raised a hand, getting the attention of a servant. The servant came closer and kneeled. Ozai then spoke. Summon Azula and Zuko and have them come to me. The servant saluted his master and walked away. Iroh found a place out of the way to stand. It wasn't long until Azula and Zuko came into the throne room. You summoned us, father, both children asked before shooting each other a snarl due to the jinx. Ozai then spoke. Your uncle, Iroh, has brought it to my attention that the both of you are warring against each other for my throne. The throne that I still sit on. Zuko and Azula swallowed the lump in their throat as a bead of cold sweat rolled down their cheeks. We mean no disrespect, father, Azula said. We mean to only prove ourselves worthy in your sight, Zuko tagged on. Ozai sat silent behind the flame, letting tension fill the air. After about eight seconds had passed, he spoke. Your rivalry could become destructive. Therefore, I shall channel it into other things. I will send you both to the war front, where you may continue your attempts to outdo each other. The goal I will set is Ba Sing Se. Capture for me Ba Sing Se. Both Zuko and Azula's eyes widened into a smile before their expressions darkened onto an evil grin while staring at one another. You are to set out immediately, Ozai said. The two made their way off to prepare. Iroh stepped back in front of the Fire Lord. Ozai, that was not what I had in mind. Ozai looked to his brother. It is exactly what I desire it to be. Ozai, this is damaging your children. The flames by the throne rose in anger. Am I not their father? Do I not get to decide what they do? 
It was I who decided when their lives began, and it is I who decides what they shall do during their tenure in this world. They will both fight in my name, and both shall do my bidding as I command. Let them quarrel with each other. It will only make them all the more zealous to obey me. Iroh sighed and walked away from his brother. There was nothing more that he could do. Zuko and Azula both left the Fire Nation, headed for Ba Sing Se. The two of them would take their own fleets in their own directions. They would plot how to capture Ba Sing Se in their very own way. Zuko believed that the sheer might of the Fire Nation should be enough. They just needed to breach the walls. And he had an idea on how to do it. There had been a mechanist living in the Northern Air Temple who had been coming up with devices left and right that the Fire Nation was requisitioning for themselves. He was even in the process of finishing a hot air balloon that could float through the skies. Zuko would requisition some of the greatest minds of the Fire Nation and would bring them to the Northern Air Temple, where he'd have them work with this person to finish his new weapons. Two particular weapons in general. The first was a flotilla of war balloons, and the second, which was equally important to them, a drill. Something that could pierce the wall of Ba Sing Se. It took some time to get everything ready, but as soon as it was, Zuko set out for Ba Sing Se. It was then that black smoke filled the skies, signaling the oncoming invasion of the Fire Nation's newest heir. The drill was there, but not one drill, no, there were at least four of them, and they were each boring into the wall at the four cardinal directions. Fire Nation troops were on standby to protect each one and to serve as the invasion force to create a foothold within Ba Sing Se. The Earthbenders were caught off guard by the drills, as they were completely formed of metal, which was harder and more stubborn than stone. They could not bend it, and they were having a hard time damaging it, as the only thing they had was large boulders. The best they could do was attempt to somehow pinch off the drill, but that was easier said than done. The shape of the head made this an improbable task, but what they didn't realize at this time was that the black smoke that had been caused by the drills was cover for the air balloons that were flying over the city right now. Zuko could see it. His uncle Iroh had laid siege to this city for 600 straight days, but Zuko would capture it in one. That was not to dishonor his revered uncle, but to show just how much proper technology could alter the course of war. This had become a war of three major fields. A war on the land, a war on the sea, and now a war in the air. Without the air nomads, fire was the only thing capable of suspending these balloons. Neither stone nor water could do that, but fire, fire could. Superheating the air, causing it to rise. Zuko knew it was a dangerous ploy, but he was ambitious and hungry for victory. One might say he was biting off more than he could chew, but Zuko took this as a sign of his boldness. They would fly right over the capital and drop down under the castle itself. An elite and brave squadron would overrun the castle and take their king before the war could continue. And with the king captured and the outer wall breached, Ba Sing Se would have no other choice but to surrender to the Fire Nation, lest the entire city be scorched. Zuko felt this was a genius plan, and so he began to execute it, and he and his soldiers dropped down on top of the castle. The guards would fight back, but Zuko and his squad were highly trained. They broke through the lines and reached the throne room. Zuko stood before the door as he removed his mask and helmet. Two of his soldiers opened the doors. He strode in triumphantly, only to see that the king was already on his knees, surrounded by his own personal hands, the Dai Li. On the throne sat Azula, fan in her hand. Zuko was shocked. Azula, how long have you been on the throne? She thought about it. At what hour did you begin your assault? 4 a.m., Zuko responded. Azula smiled. I've been sitting on this throne since midnight last night. Zuko was angered by this. You used me, he said. She shook her head. Not in the slightest, dear Zuzu. I simply waited until I knew you were coming. I wanted you to see me grasping the prize you so desperately wanted. I could have captured Ba Sing Se weeks ago while you were still tinkering with your little toys. I waited for today, just so I could steal your thunder. Zuko raised a finger and pointed it at her. Father will hear about this. Azula laughed. He already has Zuzu. I sent him a letter right before your little assault began, declaring that Ba Sing Se was now under my control. Zuko's fists clenched. He slowed for a second and took a breath. He smiled. Ah, my bad then. Congratulations on your victory, sister. Together, the two returned to the Fire Lord's throne room for a report. He stood there before them, reading the letter. Very good, Azula. Turning the Dai Li against the king. You have once again proven that the dagger is mightier than the sword. He looked to Zuko and spoke. And what do you have to say, Zuko? Zuko looked up and smiled. My sister worked very intelligently, and her wit and deception was near flawless. I'm grateful that my plan was a success. Azula looked over. Your plan? Ozai raised a brow. Zuko smiled and spoke. I won't steal your glory, sister. You captured Ba Sing Se. All I did was distract the soldiers with my attack. 
I was nothing more than a distraction that caused the castle's guard to lighten up and fortify the front lines. Zuko looked to his father. That reminds me, father. I developed these along with the mechanist in the Northern Air Temple. I'll present them to you for mass production. With it, we'll rule land, sea, and air all at once. If I dare say, the hot air balloon is my favorite. He offered his father the schematics to these new weapons. Ozai's eyes were slightly wide as he looked down at his son. He smiled and put his hand upon his shoulder. Very good, Crown Prince Zuko. Your contributions to the war in Ba Sing Se, and soon the whole world will not be forgotten. Azula's eyes were wide with rage as she looked into Zuko's sneering face. She had not known that her brother could be so cunning and deceptive. Father, now that Ba Sing Se has been captured, nothing stands against you any longer, correct? Ozai looked over at her. I recently got word from a commander in the field that the Avatar has reappeared. An airbender, it seems, the last of his kind. He's making his way to the Northern Water Temple to find a master. I'm mustering an assault force to push into the Northern Water Tribe to kill him and take the city. The Water Tribe will be the final nail in the coffin that gains us victory. And without the Avatar, nothing can stop us. Are you volunteering to capture this Avatar and the city, Azula? Ozai asked. Azula smiled. I am, father. Zuko's hands began to bleed due to just how hard he was clenching them. She was trying to pull favor back. He couldn't let her. His father was finally proud of him. He needed to keep that no matter what the cost. Oh, what a wonderful idea. Shall I join you, sister? Azula shook her head. No, I can do this on my own. Zuko turned his head. Oh, are you sure? This is the Avatar we're talking about. He's not to be underestimated. Perhaps it's best if we both go after him. I'm perfectly fine sharing the glory with you. After all, it's not us who truly matters here, but our father and the nation. Azula almost looked like she was two steps away from an aneurysm. It's a good idea, Azula. I do not wish to take any chances. You and your brother will be going together. Bring the Avatar to me. And so, once again, they made their way to their respective fleets. As Zuko sailed, he kept a close eye on Azula, keeping communication open as to know where she was at all times. Zuko was moving toward the Northern Water Tribe where the Avatar had to have been. He knew that for certain that Azula would attempt something cunning. She always did. A frontal assault would not do it this time. He needed to find out more about this. And so he began to study the Northern Water Tribe. He began to learn about them more and learned that the two spirits, the spirit of the moon and the spirit of the ocean, lived among them. Tui and La, push and pull, yin and yang. The two spirits in eternal harmony with each other were what gave power to the waterbenders, and it's what would give Zuko the edge. And so, as Zuko came closer to the Northern Water Tribe, he began to move his own personal squadron of a new weapon developed by the Mechanist. This wonderful new weapon was a ship, but instead of sailing upon the water, it sailed below. This was done by completely enclosing the ship and allowing hatches on the side to fill with water. The ship was designed to withstand being intentionally sunk, and then to unsink itself by applying air to the outer hull that would force the water back out and allow the ship to once again regain buoyancy. With this, Zuko would grow closer until he could reach a weak place in the ice. He then waited there as his men began to melt through it with their firebending. Once through, he made his way to the most spiritual location of them all, where he knew he would find Tui and La, as well as the Avatar. Once he arrived there, he was confronted by Aang, but Aang would not attack. The reason for that being that Zuko now held the moon spirit in his very hands, threatening to kill it. As he held it, the moon turned blood red, and the water bending of the northern tribe began to weaken and fall away. Unable to defend themselves, the Fire Nation quickly marched through, all the while Azula was attempting to force the chief into surrender. She was surprised to see that Zuko had managed to find the Moon Spirit and capture it. A bold plan, an irreverent one. Aang begged Zuko to reconsider, bargaining as much as he could. Zuko would smile. I will let the Moon Spirit live, but only if you come with me. Aang would agree. He had no choice. Zuko would have Aang chained. Then he would remind Aang, this entire tribe is under my control. If you flee from me, I'll simply have the spirit killed. Do not test me. And with that done, Zuko would return to the Fire Nation with Aang in tow. Aang would be thrown into a prison and there he would remain. Azula had failed a second time. Zuko had captured the Avatar and the Northern Water Tribe. The war was all but over and Zuko was the one taking credit. He had taken credit for her achievement in Ba Sing Se and had once more taken credit for her capture of the chief by bringing with him also the Avatar. She couldn't believe it. This seemed so uncharacteristic of Zuko. She had never known him to be so cunning and mischievous. Was it possible that he was simply better than her? No, no, he was not. He could not be. She knew where she had to have beaten him and that was in combat. 
As Ozai commended Zuko for his growth and potential, he declared that he had decided to make him his heir. Azula stood. No. Ozai and Zuko both looked at Azula. Azula would stand there. I refuse to accept this. I have trained tirelessly for years to prove that I was a more worthy heir than him. You forget your place, Azula. It's I who decide will replace me, not you. Azula stood resolute, staring at her father. It is fate who decides who will replace you, she said. Ozai was at the peak of his rage. You dare dishonor me. In my castle, perhaps you need to learn a lesson. Perhaps I should burn you the same as I burned Zuko. Maybe then you would understand your place. She stood there. Agni Kai, fine, I'll fight you. I'll fight both you and Zuko at the same time. The throne belongs not to the favorite child of the firstborn, but to the strong. I should have thought you would understand that, father. Ozai stood there for a second. He looked back at Zuko and then to Azula with the most nefarious smile. Is that so? Okay, fine. He looked back at Zuko. There shall be an Agni Kai. The winner of it will be named the new Fire Lord. The two prepared for their duel. As they stepped out into the yard, Ozai was present. This was a private matter, and none were allowed to watch save members of the royal family. This Agni Kai will determine who shall lead according to fate's dictation. It will be a duel to the death. This caused a spark of terror in the hearts of both Zuko and Azula. Iroh attempted to stop him. No, Ozai. You can't force your children to kill each other. This is madness. Ozai looked to Iroh. Silence. I shall decide what's best for my children and my nation. You have nothing, Iroh. You are nothing. Stay quiet. He then looked to his children. Let the winner become the Fire Lord. Let the loser go to their grave without honor. Let the duel begin. Zuko and Azula looked at each other with slight terror in their eyes. But as their eyes met, they realized what they were doing this for and their demeanors turned stern. They stood and began to fight. Zuko's white flames against Azula's blue. Iroh watched this happen, and as if it were a moment of revelation, he recognized just how far the royal family and Fire Nation had fallen. Ever since Lu Ten's death, Iroh had been a member of the White Lotus, and they had always strove to help the Avatar in their moment of need, and right now Iroh had chosen a side. He stood from his seat and pushed his fist forward in Ozai's direction. Ozai would turn and be struck, his cloak set ablaze. Azula and Zuko stopped their duel for a moment to see what was happening. Ozai would rip his cloak free and toss it aside. He would look back in shock and anger. Traitor! You traitor! Ozai would stand there. No, brother. The traitor here is you. You've betrayed your family, your nation, and the entire world. And for such a dishonor, I challenge you to an Agni Kai. Ozai stood there and smiled. Fine. He strode out to the field, basically shoving Azula from it. Iroh would walk to Zuko and put his hand on his shoulder. That's enough, Zuko. The one who needs to fight for his honor is your father. Zuko stepped off the field. Ozai got into his stance to prove how much business he meant. Iroh would get down into his own stance. Ozai would begin the battle by throwing three blasts from his fists before jumping with a bit of a spin and firing a wave from his feet. Iroh would capture the flames mid-air, utilizing techniques he had learned from studying waterbenders and would spin the flames around him before firing them back at Ozai, with a little extra touch of heat from his own fire. Ozai would split the flames down the middle. He would walk forward and begin to form a set of flame whips, with which he'd begin to strike Iroh. Iroh wasn't the most maneuverable man, and though he was strong, he was out of shape, unlike Ozai, who seemed to be in peak physical condition. Ozai's whips would strike Iroh, causing burns to appear on his body. Ozai would once again bring the whips down, but Iroh would catch them in his hand and begin to entwine them across his arms. Ozai stood across the yard from him. You are a traitor, and the punishment for traitors is death. Ozai would open his mouth and begin to breathe fire. Iroh, from his hands and knees, would open his mouth and begin to breathe fire back at him. But as Iroh thought about what might happen should he die, he realized that either Zuko or Azula would perish in the upcoming duel. His love for them gave him strength. He remembered the teachings of the dragons and used it to empower him. Suddenly, the flames Iroh was breathing shifted their hue to a myriad of different colors. It was as if all the colors of the rainbow were present within him as he breathed them out at Ozai. The flames grew stronger as Iroh cried and stepped forward, and at that moment Ozai knew he would die. He cried out for mercy, but the moment he did, he was overtaken by the flames. Ozai was thrown back. Iroh stood there and took a deep breath. He would walk over to Ozai and kneel down by his brother's charred body. You... You killed your own brother! Iroh shook his head. No, my brother, Ozai, died a long time ago and was replaced by this fantasy of a phoenix king. 
and with that, Ozai died. Iroh looked back at Zuko and Azula, who stood there in shock. Your duel is over, Iroh declared, by order of your new Fire Lord. And so, Iroh ascended to the throne. The war was almost over. After a hundred years, the war had ended with Fire Nation victory. But the victory was bittersweet to the world. Iroh would go to the cell where they held Aang. Iroh would speak. The world is in ruin, young Avatar. It needs you more than anything right now. Aang would begin attempting to put these shattered pieces of the world back together, as Iroh did with the White Lotus. The Fire Nation viewed Iroh as the worst Fire Lord in history, who usurped the throne as traitor and would not allow him to serve for very long. But Iroh would be certain to train up Azula and Zuko to be proper Fire Lords, and would teach them a better way to solve their differences. In the end, hilariously enough, the throne of the Fire Lord was determined by a simple game of Pai Shou, which Zuko won. Azula was thrown into insanity and depression, having felt as if her life meant nothing at all and that she was nothing more than a reject. But it was during this time that Iroh, the former Fire Lord now, would constantly visit her and talk with her, hoping to show her the true value of herself. And eventually she would come too. Zuko also ruled with wisdom and knowledge, listening to his uncle and learning that benevolence and compassion were not weaknesses but strengths. It was only after Zuko and Azula both went to the dragons to train, as Iroh had done, that they truly understood their place in the world, and how the Fire Nation should be governed. Together, they declared that they would forge a new path ahead, one of peace, and so it was. At the end of every war, one must tally the losses, and without any true gain, only pain and resentment remained. But Iroh, Azula, Zuko, Aang, and the White Lotus planned to take the shattered pieces of the world and put it back together again, hoping that one day it might heal. And that's the end of my story. What do you think? I had a blast making this video. The Avatar The Last Airbender series has always been very special to me, and the characterization of the Fire Nation royal family has always been intriguing. But what did you think? Did you enjoy the video? If so, be sure to like and subscribe, and ring that bell to be notified of more videos like this. And be sure to comment below to give us more ideas you'd like to see in the future. If you can't wait until said future's arrival, then take a look at these videos here. Maybe they can tide you over until then. Peace out.